Okay, antiemetics is really short. There's only a few drugs, but they're all pretty much new. I don't think we've talked about any of them yet, um, or maybe very briefly. Antiemetics is a nice one because I never have to update this because this literally never changes. I don't think it's changed since I've been practicing pharmacy, which is good and bad, right? I don't really know why exactly no one comes out with new antiemetics, but they don't. Maybe it's because the ones we have work as fast as we can get them to work, and a newer drug would be expensive and no one would pay for it versus an alternative. Probably something to do with it economically, but either way, we've pretty much use these for a while and uh, nothing's really changing significantly in this world. So from a nice perspective, from you guys, you can know this and know it for probably the next 10 years because again, unless something crazy happens, I don't really see this changing. So nothing's really in the pipeline. Um, not that no one gets nauseous, right? It's probably one of the most common presentations in urgent care or ERs, but uh, certainly the drugs we have could be improved upon, but that's just the world we live in. So. Um, so nausea can have a ton of different symptoms associated with it, or a ton of different course, causes of uh, presenting that way. So that's one of the things that you guys as the diagnosticians need to tease out. Um, but basically what's happening here is your body is trying to get rid of something. There's some sort of, uh, something's triggering your chemo re receptor zone and causing a nauseous reflex or uh, a vomiting reflex. And so to approach that pharmacologically, we work with the receptors in that particular part in the brain and try and block things or alter things so that the body's perception of whatever is making it want to vomit is dissipated. And so that's the general goal here. Um, of course, there's other things we want to do too. Um, hydration, electrolyte imbalances are certainly things we'd want to approach. Um, there's specific patient populations like pregnant patients that are more prone to this that uh, you'll want to take extra precautions with. We'll talk about that during the OB section in the summer a little bit more in detail, though. All right, so the different mechanisms in nausea, nausea and vomiting are muscarinic receptors. So there's a cholinergic component to that. Remember, that's a cholinergic subreceptor. Uh, there's dopamine receptors, histamine receptors, and serotonin. There's also something called neurokinin-1, which I don't care you know about. There's a drug called a prepotent that is only used for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Everything else is pretty broad, though. So, yeah, so you might be thinking, well, muscarinic receptors, can you give anticholinergic medications for nausea? Yes. So Benadryl would work for nausea. Um, it's not the greatest one, but it certainly is one. Most of these involve blocking something. So you're blocking dopamine or blocking serotonin receptors. You aren't agonizing the receptors. So these are, but there are some caveats to that. So how do we work within those different receptors uh, within the brain, and how do we manipulate them? There's a couple ways we can do it. So there's a, let's start with the anticholinergics. There's a product called scopolamine, which doesn't really have a role in the treatment of nausea itself, however, it's a prophylactic agent. So anybody take, use one of these for cruise or something, get motion sickness? Yeah, it's really common. I think they're over the counter some places. Uh, people keep telling me that, but I don't think that's the case in Minnesota. I could be wrong. Or at least the dose you get over the counter isn't the same as the RX dose. Anyway, uh, but they're really common. It's a prophylactic agent. A lot of people take them before they get on a boat or a long car ride if they get motion sickness. And it's a transdermal patch. It goes below the ear, as you can see in this picture here. Uh, it takes two to four hours prior to um, your trip to actually kick in. So um, it, you can use these for a lot of different situations. It doesn't have to be for motion sickness. In fact, sometimes they'll use these for post-op pain, like our anesthesia providers will stick one of these on a patient a couple hours before surgery ends. So it helps with their um, post-op uh, nausea symptoms. Side effects, uh, it's anticholinergic, so you're going to get dry mouth, drowsiness, possibly vision disturbances, but um, that's rare. Usually it's pretty well tolerated compared to taking like a Benadryl. Um, it's not going to be as significant. These would be pretty fairly low incidence. Uh, again, very well tolerated option. Um, the only thing is to make sure that if you're going to give this to somebody, whether it's inpatient or outpatient, you just make sure they understand the two to four hour need. This won't work quickly. And that's the big thing to, to take away from a scopolamine patch. But it certainly is a useful option. Antihistamines, um, diphenhydramine, uh, we can use for a number of different situations. This one's one I like to remember as an okay in pregnancy choice. It's like category B or something close to that. I haven't gotten to those, so that probably means nothing to you guys right now. But it's relatively well known that it's non-harmful for pregnant patients. Um, 
it is sedating, as we've talked about before, so that's a problem with it, but it is uh, does tend to work as both an antihistamine and an anticholinergic medication, so it does trigger a couple different receptors in the brain, and so you do get some anti-emetic response to it. Um, promethazine is sort of a hybrid antihistamine, hybrid antipsychotic agent, and um, some of you may know promethazine as uh, certain rappers like to abuse this drug. I shouldn't say rappers. Certain people like to abuse this drug. <laughs> Seems like it's fairly prominent in the hip hop industry. And uh, this is my dork moment of the day. Um, I, I heard the term lean in a song, and I didn't know what that was. I felt really stupid because I, <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't say I like drugs of abuse, but drugs of abuse is an, in, an interest of mine. Like I think addiction medicine is, is medically interesting. Um, so I think I know a decent amount of drugs of abuse, and I didn't know what lean was. Like I'm here Googling lean. Like what is lean urban dictionary? And sure enough, this is what lean is, if you didn't know. Um, it's promethazine with codeine cough syrup. And so promethazine isn't really used a ton as an anti-emetic anymore, but it's kind of making a resurgence by itself. We give it IV a lot. Um, Post-op um, pregnancy, I think they use it occasionally for OB patients. But anyway, you can use promethazine in a lot of different ways. But orally, it's usually used as this cough syrup with codeine. And so it's not the best option because it's heavily abused. And I don't even know if they make it anymore. I think they do. Some companies do. The major company that's pictured here is Activist, and they used to make this stuff. And they took it off the market because they realized most of it was getting abused. Um, but then I think there's some other companies that make it now. So I don't know. Anyway, it's not an effective cough syrup. But promethazine is a, a, a decent choice as an antihistamine because... It combines antihistamine, uh, sorry, a decent choice is an antiemetic because it combines its antihistamine with its dopamine antagonist properties, which is the next category. So it's sort of a hybrid class in and of itself. Yes? Dramamine and Dramamine. Dramamine, oh shoot, what is Dramamine? Dramamine is a very weak antihistamine. Okay. Yeah, so it, I don't know if it works more on the histamine side or it's slightly anticholinergic, but yeah, it's basically, I should have that in here. Um, but it's a, compared to scopolamine, scopolamine is going to be a much more potent uh, effect. And it's got the long lasting effects because it's transdermal. But essentially, they both have slightly anticholinergic and scopolamine is not an antihistamine at all, whereas dramamine is a weak antihistamine. It's kind of like, I think a dramamine is like a weak Benadryl type drug. All right, um, the dopamine receptor antagonists are going to be probably the best drug or the, the drug with the most evidence, which isn't saying much, that demonstrate actual benefit for um, people who are already experiencing nausea and vomiting to stopping it. All the other drugs work much better if you take them before it happens. And of course, we don't always know that. So a lot of times we're stuck taking these after the fact. But this was one of the first groups of drugs to actually demonstrate that and specifically studied in chemotherapy patients. But they work really well for any type of nausea and vomiting. And uh, copazine or prochlorpyrazine is probably one of the most common antiemetics you'll experience using in your career. Um, whether you work urgent care, ED medicine, stuff like that, it's really one um, that's used quite frequently. Dopamine receptor antagonists um, were all designed as antipsychotics. So our antipsychotic therapy has evolved from just antagonizing dopamine receptors in the brain, which can stop you from having intrusive thoughts and things like that that cause schizophrenia. Um, but they've, and while that's evolved, a lot of times these weaker ones that weren't really all that great of antipsychotics to begin with um, actually work pretty well for um, nausea. And so you might be thinking, well, if I'm taking prochlorperazine, I'm taking an antipsychotic, and kind of, yeah, technically, but it's a little bit different than that. These, again, these don't really work in the same areas of the brain as the more potent antipsychotics do, but technically, all antipsychotics that inhibit or block dopamine receptors in the brain are going to have an antiemetic component to them. Prochlorperazine just tends to be fairly well tolerated. Um, anyway, Clinical data on this drug is quite limited. It's a really old drug, but again, it's used very frequently in modern medicine. Chlorpromazine is sort of an alternative. Uh, you might get this fun fact from time to time. It's used for stopping people who have hiccups, the irretractable hiccups, and that's really where it's kind of claimed to fame is. However, it is an anti-emetic, and it would have those properties as well. It's also an antipsychotic, and it's still used sometimes in that category. So it covers a lot of bases with that drug. Um, side effects for these drugs, really, when you use them short term, probably nothing. Um, most of the time, people would get a little nervous with using anything in the antipsychotic class, especially with older antipsychotics. They cause something called extrapyramidal symptoms, which is um, EPS. 
or TD is called tardive dyskinesia. And I'll talk about these a lot more with um, psych. We'll get into more detail, but basically they're movement disorders. EPS will stop once the drug is taken away. It's basically like Parkinson's disease type symptoms. So you get uh, some muscle rigidity, tremors, things like that. Tardive dyskinesia is like weird facial movements and that's a permanent side effect. Super, super rare with these drugs. Um, more common with the more potent antipsychotics. So, I mean, we use prochlorperazine like water, and I don't know of a case of TD ever being associated with it, but theoretically it could happen. So, um, you can combine these with anticholinergic medications if you want. They have different mechanisms, so you could give that with diphenhydramine. Just know when you add those two, you're probably getting some extra sedation effects that you may or may not want. So, keep that in mind. Generally speaking, these drugs will cause a little bit of sedation, maybe a little bit of hypotension, but they probably aren't going to like make it so your patient's not going to be able to walk out of the ER or urgent care. Um, minimally sedating, especially compared to Benadryl on its own. A couple others in this class, droperidol. Uh, if only we could get any. This is one of my favorite drug shortage examples. When I first started in um, in the hospital, this was one of the most popular medications I would see dispensed. It was used everywhere for post-op nausea and vomiting, for acute nausea and vomiting in the ER, and then they started getting really popular for agitation, for psychiatric patients who were out of control, um, threat to themselves or to their family or to the staff. They would give a, a high dose of this IM and it would calm them down fairly quickly. It's fairly sedating, um, but uh, it ran out of the market. No one made it, and then it came back on the market like six months ago randomly out of nowhere we got like a few packs in and so we thought we were going to get it we put it back in stock and everything like that and all the providers were really happy and then it disappeared again <laughs> nowhere to be found never coming back so it's like what drug company would make like a tiny amount and sell it all and then never make it again i don't really understand some of this stuff but that's one where you might hear it on clinicals or something like that, that it's, a, it's an option that, again, for not nausea for sure, but also for agitation. So if you work in the ER, this is like everyone's favorite drug because those are two huge things you experience a lot, um, but we don't have any right now. So maybe in the future, maybe that drug company will get back on their game, but who knows. Um, Haloperidol is one of the hallmark antipsychotics. It's a super potent antipsychotic, and I've heard that this is used for nausea. We don't really use it at Abbott for that reason anywhere that I can think of. In fact, um, <clears throat> I had an interesting conversation. We had a new anesthesia group coming in, and they were asking me to run reports on anti-emetic use in post-operative settings. And so I, I, I was looking into that, and they're like, can you specifically look at Haldol? And I'm like, well, I don't think we use Haloperidol anywhere. And they're like, oh, I'm sure you do. No, we don't stock it in any of our post-op areas. And personally, if I was getting an anti-emetic, this is the last thing that you're going to give me. Please don't ever give me this if I'm your patient. Not because it doesn't work, because it's super sedating. If somebody's going to get EPS or tardive dyskinesia, it's going to be because of Haloperidol. It's not going to be because of prochlorperazine. Like, start with something else. So I don't know why some sites are using Haloperidol. Is that, that worries me a little bit and that this group wants to come in and you do that makes me a little concerned. Fortunately, not really my decision, um, but I think it's a little overly potent. In my ED career, I used haloperidol one time that I can remember on somebody with really bad nausea that nothing else was working on. I talked to a couple of my ED colleagues that worked on there regularly more than I do now, and um, they said, yeah, like once or twice that they can ever remember using it. So it's really rare, at least at my hospital. Again, I don't know what other places do, but I personally wouldn't be a fan of that. Just because, again, this is still one that's used pretty regularly for schizophrenia, and it's a very powerful antipsychotic. It lasts a long time. It's really sedating. If you gave somebody a dose of this, they're probably going to be passed out in your ER for hours. So that's another thing to consider. So just be conscious when using that one. But technically, I wanted to tell you about it just because it does fall into this class, and you might see it used here and there. And Reglan. Reglan's probably... a in addition to metoclopramide, going to be, or sorry, metoclopramide, that's what this is. Metoclopramide or Reglan is the brand name of this. Um, and in addition to prochlorperazine, going to be the most commonly used one out of this class. A lot of different mechanisms of action. It's a dopamine receptor antagonist. It also has serotonin antagonism and some anticholinergic properties to it, too. Um, that doesn't mean it's the best one out there. In fact, studies would say it, it might not be any better than anything else, but, or it may actually be less potent than something like prochlorperazine. But, the nice thing is that side effects are very minimal. You get, yes, technically you can get EPS like with the other ones or dystonias, things like that, but it's very, very low incidence. Yes. You said anticholinergic. Did you mean Yes, yeah, sorry, anticholinergic. Yeah, you wouldn't want to give somebody cholinergic effects. Thanks for my typo there. That would cause the opposite. 
Uh, this one, even though it's got sort of a mix mechanism, you still don't want to combine anything within this class with another thing. So if you gave somebody prochlorpyrazine, um, you don't want to give them metoclopramide right away. You can wait till the prochlorpyrazine's out of their system and then try metoclopramide, which would take a couple hours, but don't give them back to back. You don't want to combine two from this class. That just increases your risk of something like this happening substantially, and that's where you get into trouble with these medications. But by themselves, very, very well tolerated. Uh, medical opermides category B in pregnancy, it's really commonly used in OB patients. I, I kind of keep this and Benadryl in the back of my head as the two common OB ones, and then maybe promethazine if those two aren't working. Prochlorpyrazine is not as well studied in pregnant patients, so we don't usually use it. And then um, as far as the other options within this class, there's a lot of other antipsychotics on the market. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is because Due to the shortage of droperidol and just wanting to have other options available to us, sometimes we try some of these, or we try prochlorpyrazine, it doesn't work, or we try reglan and it doesn't work, and we want something else. People have turned to the second generation antipsychotics, which do a bit different things. They work on dopamine receptors, but they also work on serotonin and some other areas of the brain. And so there's a drug called olanzapine or Zyprexa, which has been um, one of the it's a, it's a it's an older drug. It's been on the market for probably like 25 years, um, but it's technically a second generation antipsychotic. It's a little newer, and I'll go through this more during schizophrenia when we talk about them in detail. But basically, people have started using this as an IM or an IV product as an antiemetic in low doses, lower than you would see with like uh, you know somebody treated for acute hallucinations or something like that. So. It is an option. It is something you'll see used. Um, the nice thing about second generation antipsychotics is they really don't have a lot of EPS related side effects. In fact, acutely they're sedating, but other than that, they don't really have many side effects to, to worry about. So it is maybe an option to think about. And depending on what provider, I feel like it's super provider specific on what they like. I think our older providers tend to really stick to metoclopramide, prochlorpyrazine. They don't really touch Cyprexa or olanzapine generic name, but the newer ones like it more. It depends on where they trained and what they got, just from what I've seen personally. So it just depends on where you train, what you might experience with your preceptors, what you might think works or how they explain it to you. But all these are viable options. I don't want to say that second generations aren't a good choice. They just aren't as well studied in this area. The, the trials are really small, and um, we don't really know exactly how to dose them as well. The dosing's kind of like, well, let's just give a mini dose compared to what we'd give for schizophrenia. Is that really the right approach all the time? I don't really know. But they do seem to work okay, so it is an option. Figured I'd mention it. All right, and then the really big class of drugs and probably the most popular drug on the market, uh, in the next slide anyway, is uh, serotonin receptor antagonists. So these ones uh, represent the serotonin component in the chemoreceptor trigger zone and uh, are present on the vagal nerve. So by um, antagonizing that receptor, you block impulses and hopefully block the nause nause nauseous re response or the vomiting reflex. Um, they're probably the most ubiquitous and well-tolerated antiemetic we have. And you can combine them with anything else. So these drugs could be combined with any of the dopamine drugs we just talked about. The, um, there's a bunch of different products available. There's really one that's the most common. That's the only one I'm going to test you on. And there's a few others that are mostly reserved for odd chemotherapy-related indications. Um, you can give them in multiple routes. They come in PO, ODT, which is an orally dissolving tablet, IV, and IM. Um, PO is probably as effective as IV, so unless somebody's Obviously, if somebody's vomiting, they can't take something PO, but if they can, the PO route might be the best choice. Um, a lot of the randomized trials out there fail to really show any difference between any of these agents amongst themselves. So there are four on the market right now. Ondansetron or Zofran is, is by far and away the most common one. So 99% Ondansetron, 1% everything else, which is why I don't care you know any of these other medications. Um, Zofran is, uh, you know, again, it's going to be used everywhere. Any practice you see, it's the go-to antiemetic for essentially any scenario. Um, so if you know Zofran, you know Compazine, and you know Reglan, those three, those are probably going to make up 95% of what you might use in, in most practices. Now, if you go into oncology or something like that, you're going to see a lot more different regimens and, and stuff like that. But basically, that's kind of, in a nutshell, antiemetic. So Zofran is going to be super popular. On the ODT tablet, uh, sometimes you can find that that's kind of expensive. So the regular tablets are just as effective. The ODT doesn't work any faster, really. The only purpose of it is that it dissolves and then it maybe can absorb faster once it hits the small intestine. 
but um, you still have to swallow it. So if somebody's throwing up, it's not like it absorbs buccally or sublingually or something like that. Yes? Um, Orally dissolving tablet. Sorry, yeah. There's a few drugs that present that way, um, especially when we talk about antipsychotics. For people who cheek medications, we'll talk about ODTs again. There's a lot of them that come that way. Yes? So you swallow it? Is that the person you want to swallow it? Yeah, you you do, but you have to make sure that you swallow that too. Like some drugs, you might um, let it dissolve in your mouth, and it might absorb through the mucosal in the cheek or underneath the tongue. This is not the case. You actually still have to get it into the GI tract to get it through. Yes. So you don't want to swear about the last one. Which one? Oh no, uh, chytril or granitron, dilansetron, and pelonisetron. I don't want you to know. I won't test you on those. The only serotonin antagonist that'll come up on the exam is on dansetron. They're just there for your information if you're curious as to why we do them. And again, most of them have to do with chemotherapy-related nausea and vomiting. Uh, very well tolerated. Like I said, um, headache is probably the only thing that occurs frequently in patients. But um, we also use antiemetics to treat headaches. So the question is, do those patients have a headache already? And sometimes when people are nauseous and vomiting, they have a headache. So again, is that really the cause of the drug or just the po population we're treating? QTC prolongation is the one thing to maybe think about with this. Um, the, the big takeaways with QTC and ondansetron for you guys, I would say, would be stacking agents that prolong QTC. By itself, I wouldn't ever worry about it. And I would never worry about it in um, a PRN situation. If you're using it one time or a couple times, even if their QTC is a little prolonged, one dose of um, Zofran to get their nausea under control is probably not going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, if you're giving it to them every eight hours, high dose, around the clock, then yeah, you might want to consider what else they're taking and make sure you don't have other QT prolonging agents on board. But for the most part, it's a pretty safe medication. That's just one thing to watch out for as far as side effects goes. We'll talk about its use in pregnancy, which is a little controversial too. Uh, I'm not going to get into that right now. It's generally uh, thought to be well tolerated and for a long time it was the drug of choice in pregnancy but that's kind of changed recently it's sort of fallen as like a third or fourth line option still thought to be safe but um, again I'll talk about some of the data when we talk about OB. Uh, glucocorticoids have antiemetic capabilities as well they're pretty effective and mostly studied with respect to chemotherapy um, mechanism we don't really know why they cause an antiemetic effect um, dexamethasone is usually almost always used it's probably useful for other types of nausea and vomiting outside of chemotherapy, but not really well studied. So it's usually going to be, uh, you know, further down the road. You wouldn't use this right away. You'd start with your dopamines or your serotonins or maybe an anticholinergic, and this might be your fourth choice if you couldn't get it under control with that. The nice thing is, is one dose of a steroid is probably not going to have a huge side effect related impact on the patient, but um, you should be able to see the antiemetic effects of it relatively quickly. So it's pretty safe and harmless to try this on somebody if you decided to go down that road, like if the other agents weren't working as well as you wanted them to. Uh, cannabinoids. So I can't not talk about these, right? Uh, so first discovered in patients using marijuana during chemotherapy cycles, so people were using their own marijuana. Um, it found that it had an anti-emetic effect or, you know, anecdotally re reported good results with it. Currently, the cannabinoids out there are only approved for chemotherapy-induced or severely refractory nausea and vomiting. doesn't mean you couldn't use them in other situations, but that's what it's technically approved for. There are two cannabinoid products on the market right now that are FDA approved, so we're not talking about medical marijuana at this point. This would be an actual product. So there's dronabinol, which is marinol, which people may or may not have heard of. Um, it's basically a synthetic THC purified. And so why that's a class three and marijuana is a class one, I don't really understand it exactly how the government comes up with this stuff, but that's the way we, and I'm not trying to be political with that. I'm just, you know, from an observational perspective, this is basically THC. Um, so just ingesting it orally. It's superior to placebo um, compared to taking nothing. It works better than that. Um, and there's been some studies that show that for refractory nausea and vomiting, it's better than prochlorperazine. So it is proven to have some good antiemetic effects there. Um, however, there was a study that I also found that showed it was inferior to metoclopramide, but it was kind of small and not great. So anyway, it has some antiemetic properties. And the question is, that how effective is it going to be? Um, especially if you're talking to, if you work with patients who maybe fall into that chemotherapy, um, refractory nausea and vomiting, and they want, you know, do you try this? Do you just give them medical marijuana access if your prescriber 
um, is registered with that system. That's you know personal debate. Yeah, then there's going to be a forum we'll have at some point about medical marijuana here. Uh, but at the same time, um, the mechanisms there, right? It's going to be the same thing. You're just ingesting it versus inhaling it, or you know you can ingest medical forms too. So yes. So this would have no difference than the, you know, the high of. That's a good question. I think it's such a low dose compared to what I would understand like you might get from a medical cannabis company. It's going to be different than that, but yeah, I don't I don't know exactly. It is THC, so the question is do the CB the components that are like the products that are more CBD heavy, the, those are theoretically the better nausea ones from what I understand. So, I don't know exactly if this is even the right product, but it does seem to have some effect. Does it get people high? Well, it's a controlled substance, so during trials, people said that they did report euphoria and things like that, which is why it has a potential for abuse tagged onto it. So, yeah, theoretically, but um, I don't know how many people are abusing Marinol personally, but yeah. Um, Nabilone or Sesamet is a drug I've never actually seen, so I'm not going to test you on this at all. Um, I don't even know if you can obtain this anymore, but um, it might, you might have to jump through some hoops to get to it. It's another synthetic cannabinoid that's a direct um, cannabidiol, CB1 or cannabinoid, cannabinoid 1 receptor agonist. Um, so it's not, it's a little bit different in structure and how it's designed than Marinol. But um, yeah, again, I've never seen it prescribed or used. I don't even know if we stock this drug. So they're kind of expensive too, uh, in case you were wondering. You'd think maybe they'd be cheap. Marinol's been around for a while, but it's actually quite pricey. And you have to refrigerate it, which is really weird. So uh, storage isn't great. All right, benzodiazepines, not a traditional antiemetic and not traditionally used as an antiemetic, but they're part of a lot of chemotherapy regimens. So I thought I would just throw them in here because once you start down the pathway of treating nausea, you might run into a wall and be like, okay, I've given them a dopamine receptor. I've given them Zofran. I've given them Benadryl. Nothing's happening. If they aren't passed out at that point, should I try a benzodiazepine? <laughs> and um, this is where you might come into play. So if you've ever worked in, anybody ever scribe in like the ER or work in the ER or something like that? Some people have like vitamin A, Ativan. Um, I think like Ativan is kind of the, the cure-all for, not in a good way, but, <laughs> but a lot of people, um, a lot of times this is just, this just makes sense for some reason. So um, lorazepam by itself is a pretty good antiemetic. It's also sedating. It's also disinhibiting. It also can cause habit forming behavior. So um, it's not the best drug to use. But if somebody, um, specifically where I've seen this really useful, is if somebody is nauseous and they're really anxious too, um, these are great for panic attacks or anxiety attacks. So giving somebody lorazepam might be a good solution in that particular instance, or if nothing else is working and you want to try it. Uh, just be cautious about using it with anyone with an history of addiction. So alcohol abuse, any type of abuse, I'd probably steer clear of a benzo. But if you didn't have any red flags in that department, um, it's not a bad choice. Just know this falls in the heavily sedating category versus like, you know, especially if you gave it gave them some Benadryl and some pro prochlorperazine already, um, they're probably going to be sleeping it off for a little while. So just be prepared for that. They might sit in your ER urgent care for, I don't think you'd give Ativan IV in urgent care, but I guess I could, I don't know, maybe you would. <laughs> but not in the ones I worked at. But um, I would say that, yeah, in the ED, they're, they're probably going to be sitting in the bed for a while after that. Um, the shorter, we'll talk much more about benzodiazepines during anxiety and the differences and the half-life and all that type of stuff. But lorazepam is kind of a medium duration one, and it comes IV and oral, so there's a number of different formulations you can give it. Super common medication for both like acute anxiety and, uh, and nausea. Um, what else is there? Sedating, I covered that. What's uh, That's like a, a movement disorder specifically, so it can help... Um, yeah, so like um, one of the things they use Ativan for is if you have an agitated patient and give them haloperidol, that's a longer-acting dopamine antagonist. Or if you gave somebody that for nausea, uh, they can get those movement disorder type effects like the EPS, and lorazepam can be used to actually prevent that from happening or minimize those side effects more so. So sometimes they're used in conjunction that way. All right, so first line, is there really a first line? Um, that's debatable and probably, again, depends on the provider you're working with or depends on your personal experience and what you think is first line. I would say ondansetron is probably first line for the majority of cases. Um, but the nice thing is you can combine things. So again, you can do your, think about your big three, your, your primary two drugs, right? You've got ondansetron and then you've got a dopamine antagonist you can try. So you 
usually you're going to use ondansetron and then either prochlorperazine or metoclopramide. If those aren't touching it, then you might want to try an anticholinergic or a benzodiazepine or a steroid. And those would kind of be your three other tiers there. The real thing, the, the real takeaway here, and the thing I want you to know is don't stack up your D2 agonists. So if they give you a question about combining metoclopramide and prochlorperazine, just know that that's probably something I'll test you on. So don't do that. Um, other than that, you can mix and match to your heart's content, and there's not really any issue with it. Um, other than just making sure that you're giving the drugs adequate time to work, right? So if you're giving them IV, you know, make sure that's going to work pretty quickly. If you give them PL, make sure you give them adequate time to absorb. Um, cost isn't something a big deal. Most of these drugs are super cheap. Uh, route of administration, certainly. Uh, you're usually going to be looking at non-oral routes, right, because people are nauseous. But uh, in some cases, you might be able to get away with an oral route. Yeah. Do you have, like, an estimate time frame of how long Depends on the drug, but you're probably looking at onset of about an hour for effects for most of them. Faster for some medications, like Ativan would probably for be, IV. yeah, for IV. Ativan, probably really fast. Steroids, like dexamethasone, probably longer. And then Zofran, Prochlorperazine, Metoclopramide, probably somewhere in the between there. I'd say maybe like 15 to 45 minutes, up to an hour to see the effects of them. It's a good question. I should add a table with that for next year. All right, so here's a random case I've got. This is BK. She's a 23-year-old female who presents to your emergency department with acute nausea and vomiting, secondary to a migraine headache. You order ondansetron and prochlorperazine. Um, she reports some relief, but your RN reports she has had another episode of emesis just when you thought you were out of the woods. Now, what other options might you consider, and what do you want to know? Is she pregnant? That's a great choice. So if she was pregnant, should you have given her prochlorperazine? Probably not. <laughs> so, so pregnancy, which ones uh, maybe are preferred? This is kind of beyond the scope, and I won't test you on a pregnant patient for this one. But yeah, yeah. So I think I heard all of them. So I heard Benadryl, I heard metoclopramide, and I heard um, dexamethasone as well. So steroids actually are, are okay choices for pregnant patients. Um, so in this case, what's your main question here? What what could you consider giving, or what what don't you want to give? Maybe that's the better way to ask. Is there anything you want to stay away from at this point? Yeah, yeah. If you wanted to go the Ativan route, like, does she have any substance abuse history? For sure. So that's definitely another something that would be on your radar at this point. Good question. That would be a, certainly an option. What about metoclopramide? No, that's what I just said. But what if I told you she got the prochlorperazine six hours ago? Now, you don't know the durations or, or what you're supposed to do, so I don't expect you to know that, but that's usually the interval you'd dose it at. So, yeah, at that point, you could probably consider something, but at the same time, you'd want to make sure that you're you're far enough out to, to do that. And that's where ER pharmacists come in handy to bounce those ideas off of. So that's it. We covered Ativan, other ones. Um, dose is another thing I'd look at. Make sure you're using the, the appropriate and full amount. So for Zofran, for example, usually you give four or eight milligrams, four milligrams to start. You could always give another dose of Zofran to top it off if you wanted to. Um, some of the other ones are pretty much fixed doses, like they're sort of a one and done type of thing. So it just depends on the agent. Steroids, don't forget about those. The dexamethasone, I mentioned that would be something you could maybe try. Um, migraines, we'll get into that on its own, but just so so we talk about that because it's part of the case, a lot of antiemetics are kind of the recommended treatment for migraines. So we treat migraines similar to how we treat nausea in some cases. We have a lot of other drugs we use for migraine, but um, we do use the antiemetics as migraine treatment standalones, regardless of whether there's nausea involved. So um, those are just kind of side notes to this, but Prochlorperazine, for example, is something that's a primary treatment for a lot of migraine attacks, and that's something that we would use in this case, too. So that was a good starting point, so you, you thought well when you picked those two drugs to give right away. All right. Anybody have any other questions about acute nausea? All right. That's all I've got for today, then.